Lamont says, you need a chair, a good chair, and a ballpoint pen to write. Because you're going to sit in a chair a long time. And you're going to need a ballpoint pen when you're out on a walk. And you're going to write it down so you won't forget it. Stephen King counsels tenacity and doggedness. E.B. White would say, just write and write and write and read and read and write and write some more. But it is our speaker who embodies the prerequisite for a great writer, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer. And that is to understand that being precedes doing, that one is a writer. And all of our doing flows out of that. That as we are, so we do. So this writer, Leonard Pitts, award winner, accomplished, recognized by his peers, and you know what a group journalist can be. <laughs> they say he is preeminent. They say he is top of the heap. Top shelf, no dust. This one who began with his first published cartoon when he was five years old. Who understood that he was not about to accomplish to become a writer. He already was. I introduce to you the writer, Leonard Pitts. squishy 
turn the other cheek, cheek prophet of a someday and eventual promised land, when the truth is that there was an impatience in Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King did more than dream. He dreamt. And then, having dreamt, he worked to make that dream come true. He put his very body on the line to make that dream come true. That is the thing that people seldom seem to understand about Dr. King. There was an unwillingness in him to wait. There was a frustration with the status quo. There was a refusal to believe that the thing must always be simply because it always has been. Nowhere is that illustrated quite as, as visibly as in a long and justifiably famous passage from his letter from a Birmingham jail, which was written in response to a statement from a group of, group of white clergymen who were chastising the Negroes for their refusal to wait patiently for their citizenship rights to be granted to them. Dr. King wrote, for years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence, and we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering, as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children, and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky, and see her begin to distort her little personality with an unconscious hatred I'm sorry, and see her begin to sort of little, her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking an agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stands, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. So, so the point is, this was not a man of infinite patience. And when he spoke of his dream, he did not mean some airy fairy abstract, something that would come upon us in some far distant day in the sweet by and by. Rather, he meant something real, something touchable and tangible, something we could work toward and bring into existence. He meant work for justice now. He meant work for brotherhood now. He meant work for housing now. He meant work to end hunger now. He meant work to alleviate poverty now. He meant work to help nations and people find ways of resolving conflict that do not involve guns and blood now. Yeah. <laughs> now, 
yes, I know that this sounds utopian. It sounds like something that could never happen because human nature does not work that way. It sounds impossible. As impossible, perhaps, as believing that a woman, a member of the largest group of second-class citizens on Earth, heir to centuries of violence and repression, legal property of men in countless cultures, could someday become the most powerful media figure in the most powerful country on Earth. As impossible as believing that a Jew could be beaten, bloody, starved, skeletal, cursed, reviled, and spat upon, and then return 60 years later and dance in the place where he almost died. As impossible as believing that a black man who 50 years ago might not have been, might have been barred from voting for president of the United States, 50 years later could be elected president of the United States. I have seen all of these things with my own eyes in the span of my own life, and it teaches me that sometimes impossible is just a word that we use for things we have not yet figured out how to do. Martin Luther King believed with a preacher's fervor and idealism in something he called the beloved community. That is a term he borrowed from Josiah Royce, who was a theologian of the early uh, 20th century, to denote a community of restoration, redemption, reconciliation. Some people think building the beloved community is impossible. Dr. King thought it was just one of those things we haven't yet figured out how to do. King thought that this was, this was a faith to which, to which he dedicated his life. And when his life ended, he became a task that he left to you and me. But you see, before we can build the beloved community, we must first rebuild the very notion of community. It is something that seems to have gotten lost in the journey from Dr. King's era to ours. I remember when I was coming up, the community was uh, the church uh, that I went to all day on Sunday. <laughs> all day on Sunday. And it was the neighbors around me. It was, it was these adults who um, I came to understand had an investment in me and had carte blanche from my mother to... One, get me straight, and two, rat me out to her if I got caught doing anything. If I, if I misbehave, Miss Hawkins right over on this side, Miss Callaway right here, Mary at the store, Mother Jones at church, Nikki Duncan, Nikki Payne, Nikki English, all of those folks. Those, those, that, that's what community meant, okay? Now, these days, I hear that the community is virtual. Strangers messaging one another across an electronic web. And it always leaves me wondering how can a virtual community do all of those things? How can a virtual community help raise a child? It cannot, of course. I submit that community exists when you have a group of people who are invested in one another's outcomes. And that is ever more a rare thing these days. These days we are more connected and yet paradoxically further apart than we ever have been.